Hello, thanks for joining us today. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed just about everything to do with running a hotel, including how hotels meet guest comfort and safety needs. Proper in-room HVAC and air treatment plays a significant role in both of those needs. During today's roundtable, which is sponsored by Friedrich Air Conditioning, we will discuss how COVID-19 has changed the indoor air quality landscape for hoteliers and how HVAC options contribute to the solution. Our first panelist today is Terry Smith, Vice President of Engineering for Marriott International. Terry oversees a team of engineers responsible for design and construction of all global new build and conversion projects in the Marriott portfolio, and is responsible for developing, maintaining, and producing global engineering design standards for all 30 Marriott brands. Also joining us is Carl Wren, Senior Vice President at Concord Hospitality. Carl brings a wealth of construction experience, having managed both ground up and renovation projects across the country, and has worked on both the general contractor and the ownership side of project management. Lou Harriman, our next panelist, former director of research for Mason Grant Consulting, is a fellow, life member, and distinguished lecturer of the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and a member of the Indoor Air Quality Hall of Fame. Since January 2020, he has served as a volunteer consultant to ASHRAE's COVID-19 Epidemic Task Force. Our fourth panelist is TJ Wheeler, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Friedrich Air Conditioning. During his tenure, he has led the product marketing and sales groups towards several of the company's most innovative milestones, including the industry's first Wi-Fi connected room air conditioner and the launches of the VRP and Fresh Air PTAC product lines. Welcome everyone. Before we dive into our topic, two quick notes for the audience. If you have any questions for our panelists as we go along, please add them on the left side of your screen in the Q&A tab, and we'll try to get to them at the end. There's also downloadable information about Friedrich's VRP system under the handouts tab, which also can be found on the left side of your screen. So welcome gentlemen, thanks for joining us today and uh, offering your expertise. We're going to start with Terry uh, with our first question. We know that guest room air quality was a major initiative before COVID. So how significantly has it been elevated since? What's what's the feeling around it nowadays? So good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, great to be here and, and thanks for every everybody participating. So I think for probably the last 10, 15 years at Marriott, we've taken a lot of pride in trying to make sure that we provide indoor air quality to customers in, in guest rooms. And really the ultimate goal there is to be able to maintain 75 degrees and 50% relative humidity. You might remember when COVID first started, one of the very first things that came out was that you have to be able to control humidity levels. You know, when you get rooms that I jokingly say, we've all been in hotel rooms where you sit on the bed and your pants get wet. Um, so we've always tried to maintain that 50% relative humidity. And then of course, ASHRAE and CDC came out and said that's critical, to, you know, because of the the moisture in the air and all that stuff, the transmission of COVID. I think the thing, the biggest change that we've made up till right now um, since COVID is we put a lot of guest room management systems in, really directed at being able to uh, reduce carbon footprint and, and energy consumption in hotels and their occupancy-based controls so that when a guest leaves or uh, a room or a room is unoccupied, we can get control of those systems. We put a lot of those things in hibernation during this time which includes in a lot of a lot of hotels also includes the ventilation system. So we're basically running those air conditioning, heating, cooling, dehumidification systems and ventilation systems 24 seven, whether a room is occupied or not. Mm -hmm. That probably makes a big difference, especially in properties that are closed. I mean, you want to keep them in as good of condition and as safe as possible for when when everything reopens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, you know, one of the things we said when this thing started and hotels started closing, you can't just put a set of chains and a padlock on the front door. You got to keep systems running. You got to keep heating, cooling, dehumidification, ventilation systems running. Domestic hot water was a big one, right? Because of potential for Legionella growth and all that kind of stuff. So even though hotels were closed, they were still having to consume a tremendous amount of energy to keep them going while, while they were, while they were closed. Mm -hmm. So Carl, from your side of the business, how is, is you know, this being elevated now since COVID? I think pre-COVID, pre, pre -COVID, you know, 
one of all the things that Terry said, and, and the biggest one that we saw, I think, over the last 10, 15 years was the fresh air requirement to every single guest room. So that's created a, a real nice um, impact to all the guest rooms rather than just, you know, I'll call it the old fashioned way where the PTAC damper was just left open and that was supposed to somehow bring fresh air to a room. And we all know that didn't work very well. So, so that's been a big change. And I think, you know, we've seen that across almost all brands. And then post COVID, you know, there, you know, <laughs> everything came out at once. And then we all thought about changing the whole system and, and MERV 19 or MERV 20 and this, you know, and, and uh, treating, treating the air with, you know, gamma rays and this and that. And like Terry and I have talked about, there's been so much information that's come at us all that, you know, it's, it's been information overload. And, and where we've come back to now at Concord is, is maybe an increase in just simple filter size. So going to like just a simple MRF, MRF 13 filter, um, even in some of the, the newer hotels that we're designing, we're looking at, I'll, I'll call it a molecule, which is a name brand, but an air purifier inside the room that simply plugs in. The only thing we got to figure out is to figure out how people don't walk away with those uh, little systems. And that's, that's, primarily been it from a, from an air quality standpoint you know the big thing has been the cleaning and making sure that the guests know that we've gone in and we've disinfected we've wiped down surfaces and we've tried to clean the room the best we can mm -hmm. and those cleaning supplies affect the air quality as well so i would think that the the in room the filters that you were talking about would go a long way to help you know, there's always people with allergies or who don't want to smell those kind of things, but improving the quality from that end as well, I would imagine. Agreed. And just from a personal point of view, I'd rather walk into a room and smell Lysol or whatever you want to call it and know that something's been done rather than just smell nothing, especially in the times that we're in. Yeah, and I'm sure you're not alone in that, so. Lou, as a member of ASHRAE's COVID-19 Epidemic Task Force, what are some of the group's guidelines about air filtration, ventilation, those types of things that hotels need to be aware of? Sure. Um, I'll just start by saying, uh, so that everyone's clear on this, is I'm not speaking for ASHRAE. I'm just summarizing some of ASHRAE's uh, uh, guidance that the group as a whole has come up with because nobody speaks for ASHRAE except the president of ASHRAE, Chuck Gulledge, this year. Um, yeah, uh, ASHRAE has published a rather extensive set of guidance for buildings of many different types. And I think probably the most useful from the point of view of uh, hotel management uh, are the core principles. And that's a nice, simple one-page document that I have neatly printed out and I glad to provide the uh, the URL of that particular thing so that people can can get it but just to summarize that um, uh, it's a page but I can summarize the key points I think for for hotel managers pretty quickly the first is uh, you got to wear masks and you got to be socially distant <laughs> and uh, and mechanical uh, things uh, HVAC and and other management things really start based on that platform. So uh, anything that ASHRAE says uh, begins with people are wearing masks indoors and they are socially distant with, with indoors according to guidance from CDC and from, and from local authorities. So we'll start with that. But after that, um, when we start talk about mechanical systems, the first is to provide and maintain at least the minimum ventilation rates per codes and standards. So for, you know, guest rooms, we're talking about uh, 25 to 40 cubic feet per minute on a continuous basis. And that's, you know, the current ASHRAE recommendations and the codes, codes, codes vary. But the key word there is maintain. <laughs> so provide and, and make sure it keeps happening. Uh, that, that the rooms are, are ventilated. The second is that MRF uh, 13 filtration is really a good minimum so that uh, we know that with MRF 13, there's a defined 
number, a defined percentage of the small particles that we're most concerned about that are going to be taken out of the air. And it's something on the order between 80 and 90 percent, depending on how tight the filter is in the frame. <laughs> so MRF-13 filtration is a, is a basic recommendation for, for COVID-19. Um, the third point is that uh, with respect to all the technologies we've been talking about here or alluding to, I should say, is that ASHRAE is pretty clear that um, it's not a good idea to just use stuff because somebody says it's a good idea or that they believe that a laboratory test has, uh, has proven something in a laboratory. Uh, the wording is use only air cleaners for which evidence of effectiveness and safety is clear. So not a good idea to, to use magical uh, magical technology. And there's a lot of it uh, in the market today. And, and so that's one of the reasons that ASHRAE is clear on that point. Um, finally, um, one thing is that air changes between occupancies. And this is probably something that, that, that is worth thinking about from a management point of view. The, the subject of, of, uh, of cross-contamination between occupants uh, subsequent to each other. So you've got, you've got somebody coming into a room and then eventually you've got someone else coming into that same room. Uh, the, the ASHRAE recommendation is that you have at least three air changes of virus cleaned air. Uh, uh, before you have one occupant come into a space that's been occupied by somebody else. And of course, that's not usually an issue with respect to, uh, to hospitality in terms of guests, but it might conceivably be an issue in terms of, uh, in terms of, of uh, the housekeeping staff. So same thing, uh, a good idea to have three air changes between occupancies uh, of, that, of that room. So that's... Uh, that's, those are the basic ones. And then the last one is just a, just a quick tip. We have seen things in the ASHRAE COVID-19 task force where there has been cross-infection uh, that has occurred within exhaust stacks. So uh, we know that central exhausts in hotels and also uh, multifamily residential are supposed to have a fan at the top of the stack that's creating a suction on that stack and if the fan isn't operating, as it didn't in a couple cases, then COVID-19 uh, viruses can flow downwards uh, from one floor to another or upwards and drift into another, uh, another apartment or another room. So pretty important to make sure that those fans at the top of the stack are actually operating and that the motor is actually connected to the fan because fan belts on rooftops in my experience sometimes break. So those are those are the thoughts there from, from an ASHRAE perspective. So no matter how great of equipment you have, if it's not installed properly and, and maintained and checked, it's it's <clears throat> doesn't make a difference. I think that that's the big takeaway uh, from the task force is that we know that uh, things are designed in a, in a rational way, uh, generally speaking, as we know, <laughs> uh, but whether or not they are operating that way is usually a different question. So the focus mm -hmm. has, has been uh, on validation and on, on investigation, visual investigation to see that the filters are actually in place and they're not clogged <laughs> and so mm -hmm. forth. Right. Good advice for so many areas of uh, building, building maintenance. So Carl, tell us about some of the changes in HVAC configuration and operation that you've put in place to have, uh, address COVID-19 concerns. Have there, have you had any new builds lately that have, have done anything different? We, if, for the most part, the answer is no, but we have looked at numerous things and tried to get underneath the cost of them. So the simple answer is, is changing filters. Like on TJ's uh, VRP units, it's a very simple um, switch out to get to MRF 13. So something like that, we're looking at incorporating on future builds. The other thing I mentioned, like a little molecule machine in the guest room that I don't have any proof that works because I'm, I'm seeing, uh, or you know, whether or not that works, but the way it's advertised that that cleans the air inside the room. Um, so those are those are the two big, big items mm -hmm. that we're looking at, you know, basic filters, 
and then a, and then a unit inside the, the rooms and potentially inside the public spaces as well to clean to clean the air. Mm -hmm. Cherry, how about at Marriott? So I, I very similar to Carl probably. So I don't think things really have changed necessarily, but we've started looking at a lot of different things. I think one of the things you have to be sensitive to is if you look at a, a technology, whatever it may be, whether it be bipolar ionization or UV filters or UVC filters or burn, whatever, burn filtration, anytime you, you, you figure something out like that, then you've automatically got to multiply times the number of rooms in, in the hotel because you've got to really do it in every room because potentially every room could be occupied. And that's where this stuff gets a little bit crazy. Um, I think right now one of the thing, one of the things that came out early on as well from ASHRAE and CDC was in, increased ventilation rates. And you know, it, I do all, all new build construction, so my increased ventilation rates, yeah, I sure can. But the problem is, it's a substantial increase in first cost with dedicated outdoor air systems. Um, they're a lot more expensive, and then let's just be quite cut quite to the, uh, right to the chase here. And somebody's got to pay the bills to operate this stuff forever, and that's kind of. So as Lou said, we're trying to keep things right now back to code what code says we have to do. So we put about 35 CFM about the dehumidified condition to make up air into a guest room. And I think we're we're right now in the process of I'm part of an indoor air quality council with Marriott that we've been working on this stuff for a year. Um, and we have investigated a lot of different technologies. And I gotta tell you, as we've talked already, all the stuff that's going on, all the conflicting information and data that's out there. It's hard to it's hard to get through all this stuff. But, you know, very similar to Carl. I don't think we we haven't made any drastic changes right now, but you know, at some point down the road, we're we're in the process of having to do that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the new builds, Terry. What about changes in room design in the future? Do you see that coming, or is the design not the issue? It's more the technology and things that go in the room that that need to be you know kept on top of. You know, I don't know that they're going to change a lot. I think we're still obviously going to have um, ventilation systems, and outdoor air systems, and exhaust systems. I got to tell you, one of the things that's always been a bit of a problem, and I'm going to play right into TJ on this one, is, uh, you know, when Frieder came out with the VRP, the VTAC unit with the outside air component to it, it was unbelievable. And it really has been a tremendous solution uh, of how we get dehumidified condition, make up ventilation air in the room all the time, and I don't have to worry about those stopping wet, you know, freezing cold guest rooms and stuff. So um, I, I think we're in a good place right now with the, the industry and where it is, especially with VRP, because we actually use quite a bit of VRP units in a lot of our hotels. Mm -hmm. And you're right, that was a perfect lead into TJ. We didn't forget about you. From the perspective of a manufacturer, what changes have you seen in room design, you know, other types of technology that could affect HVAC selection and how have you, you know, at Friedrich responded to this? Uh, good, yeah, good question. And, and yeah, great to take away. I mean, really all of the questions leading up to, to this one um, are, are, are really uh, germane to how Friedrich has approached the, the, the um, adoption or the innovation of new technology. So our, you know, our goal several years ago was to set out and see how we could solve problems, emerging problems in um, the lodging segment. So, you know, as Terry was alluding to, you know, we've uh, we've worked very closely with Terry and, and others, and, and Carl and others in the in the in the industry um, to, to identify what those challenges are. So, rooms are getting smaller; they're getting tighter. So, there so there's no longer, even though you couldn't really design for it, there used to be a lot of air leakage, right? So, you you naturally got fresh air inside of a room, um, even though you didn't plan for it or design to it. Um, but and then codes change, as Carl mentioned. And so the old way of just a lot letting the PTAC door kind of do it and an undercut door in the in the hallway, um, you know th those things changed a couple years ago or uh, years ago, and and there was a there was a, a, a technology gap. So what we set out to do with products like the VRP um, with the fresh air technology was take a room by room approach to to ensuring that you could have consistent conditioned air but also can consistent conditioned makeup air through in, you know, going into each individual room as opposed to trying to rely on a massive system and very complicated and complex systems kind of, you know, uh, Lou mentioned the, you know, the exhaust fans and um, the, the, the need for operability, you know, we, we address this on a room by room basis and think of this as 
really um, a, a, a several pieces to an indoor air quality puzzle. And it starts with heat and air conditioning, which is common, and then and then dehumidification, which is a common problem we try to solve with air conditioners. But um, unless you have technology like hot gas reheat um, or, or other things where you can continue to operate that um, you know, below the set point and, and continue to wring out moisture, you know, you're not really um, you're not able to do as, as effectively as one would, would typically like. Um, so then there's so and then the other component of that is the air is what we traditionally think of when we think of um, indoor air quality, which would be things like mechanical filtration. So you know, perfect conversation about MERV 13, and you know, Carl mentioned the the BRP is easily adaptable um, to accept a MERV 13 filter you know, as opposed to the standard MERV 8 that it comes with. Um, we also have um, UV um, options coming out for the VRP that are out now for the VRP. It allows for sterilization. So once we capture those particles um, on the coil um, in the airstream, we have UV um, sterilization. And we also have um, a product called an I-Wave um, ionization device that, that, that then ionizes uh, the particles as well. So sterilization, um, kind, of a, kind of a capture and kill um, approach, if you will. So we, we see that as, as being all of the necessary pieces that, that we as a manufacturer can help to solve within that room um, and we've done that with the VRP product and then and then also with the fresh air PCAP product, which also has variable speed technology um, and the IP um, and options uh, uh, coming for uh, UV and um, eye uh, cleaning as well. I really like how you explain it as a puzzle and there are the pieces that have to work together because I think some people think it's just you know, a one size fits all, you plug something in, you're good to go. And it really is a lot more complex than that. And that's, you know, people need to understand how that all, all works together. So I, I like that explanation. Yeah. All right, back to you, Lou. Following the outdoor standards for room ventilation has always been a good benchmark. It's often required by code. Are there ways that hotels can prove to guests that they're receiving adequate ventilation? Is there some kind of way that, that makes them understand and feel confident? I, this is a fundamental problem that we have in HVAC worldwide, uh, which is how do we, how are we sure that we're getting the ventilation uh, air that we're supposed to have? And this hasn't been a focus until now, but with COVID-19, um, my prediction is it's going to become much more important. So I, I, I will say that there are not a lot of standard products that incorporate uh, uh, things that will tell you, you know, how much ventilation air you're getting compared to what you should be getting. But I see in the future that that's likely to, to be useful. Um, I was actually interested in something that, uh, that TJ mentioned about, uh, or that someone mentioned there about uh, actually connecting to the PTAC unit, and I'm wondering if they're if they might have a way of, <laughs> of telling us how much outdoor air is coming into the PTAC unit. That would be pretty cool. Another another thing that I could see happening in the future is uh, CO2 monitoring, because CO2 monitors uh, low cost. Well, relatively low cost. I, again, to your to your point, Terry, when you multiply it by the number of rooms that Marriott has, it's a pretty big, scary number. But um, but uh, a wall-mounted uh, LCD that has a reasonably and appropriately accurate uh, CO2 sensor um, is not a terribly expensive device anymore. It used to be a six hundred dollar device. Now it's a hundred dollar device uh, and battery powered and so forth. So if you had a concentration of carbon dioxide overnight of more than a thousand parts per million, then that's probably a pretty good indication that you're not getting enough ventilation here <laughs> because that 25 or 35 CFM that, 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 that's supposed to be flooding through there is going to take care of that in a real hurry and keep it well under a thousand parts per million. So I think that um, I, I suspect that we're going to be seeing lots more uh, ways of validating the ventilation air because I think the public is going to demand it or some portion of the public likely li likely to demand it. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that more companies don't include it in their um, their clean programs that they've been marketing that says, you know, we use these cleaning products. This is our procedure for cleaning before a guest uses the room. Maybe we'll see more of that as part of those programs. This is our air quality policy and this is, you know, how we, we work this. So. 
maybe, maybe it all goes back to marketing. Everything seems to go back to marketing somehow. <laughs> All right, so kind of building on your comments earlier about there being so much information out there. So th this one will be for Terry and Carl. There are a lot of products that promise to meet these standards and codes and that you know make claims of improved air, air treatment. What do you look for to ensure that equipment performance really lives up to its claims? I mean, how do you know that it's not just magic like Lou said earlier, that it's really a good product to use? Terry, you can really you. start without being funny about it. You can really start by Googling to find out if they're really a real company or not, because there's a lot of them you can't even find a website on. Um, you know, That's I think one of the scary. things that, you know, I, I, one of the things I've struggled with, wrestled with during this whole thing is it's easy to say I'm doing something for a guest, but I believe we have to be able to prove we're doing something from a guest for a guest. I believe that, you know, Carl mentioned earlier, one of the things that we've talked about doing at Marriott is putting uh, the small portable plug in HEPA filtration devices in guest rooms. So a guest can walk in that room, see the device, hear the device running. You know, prior to COVID, nobody knew what HEPA was probably. But today, I think with airplanes, everybody knows what HEPA filtration is. And it's the best filtration technology we have. Um, I believe there's a warm and fuzzy that a guest would get by walking in a room and seeing and knowing that they're in a clean air environment. You know, Lou mentioned about carbon dioxide. You know, we are in, I've been working with manufacturers now trying to get, actually get uh, VOC sensors built into the thermostat, which is an amazing hub of technology. There's a tremendous amount of stuff that has going in there. We already use temperature, humidity, and all that kind of stuff. Why can't we go ahead and put the into that thermostat as well. And if that room is in an unoccupied mode and there's an increased level of VOC, it doesn't even have to be from, it could be from a, a, an engineer going in there painting the wall. I can go ahead and turn the ventilation system on, flush the room out and get those odors and smell out of there. Got to figure out how to stop for the smell of lights, although because Carl's point, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think going forward, uh, the, the thing that I look at the most right now is if you don't have third party independent lab certification, I don't even want to talk to you. I, you know, and I know that that's, that's probably really generic and to lose point. Yes, it was done in a laboratory and not in a hotel guest room, but I got to start somewhere. And that's, so that's pretty critical. And there's a lot of stuff out there that uh, people claim that their product can do this and whatnot. You know, when bipolar ionization first came out, for example, they see, we knew it was tested, certified, and proven to kill norovirus and E. coli and MRSA and staph and all the other nasty stuff we've been exposed to. And they were there was the belief out there that that product was, in fact, as good against coronavirus because it's a lot less of a complex uh, a virus than the norovirus was. So you spend a lot of time going through that. Stuff. There's one guy at Marriott headquarters. I don't know if he's on this call or not, but I think he must have been some life reading science paper. There is so much information there. Yes, we want an answer. We're a year into this thing. Do we have an answer today? I don't think so. But part of the reason is because we we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. And, and, and it just takes time to get through all this. So. I, I can see it now. Lysol's next big product, a little plug-in, you know, air freshener. And it, it smells like the product so that everyone thinks that everything's nice and clean. We'll have to... Trademark that, that somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that would be what we would call a very bad idea. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if someone did something like that, though. But there's lots of people yeah. with bad ideas out there. How about you, Carl? <laughs> what do you look for when you're you're trying to make sure those claims live up to their, you know, to what they're really yeah. saying? <clears throat> so I think there's two aspects to this. The one is Terry just hit. And he's he's right on. You know, we look for our trusted mechanical engineers and third party testing reports and stuff like that to make sure that what the products we're buying, the equipment and the filters, et cetera, that we're buying actually do what they say. We try and we've looked at a lot of things, advertising on our website, you know, Concord Clean Stay program, various various stuff like that to get the word out. Maybe even training front desk people to say that you know 
we have this filter, you know, it, wh whatever we're doing at the specific property. But the second aspect is it of your question is how do we make a customer truly know that it is working? I don't think anybody's figured that out yet. I think I think Lou, you know, just said it. That that's that's a great question. I mean, <laughs> I we I don't have an answer for that. Do we give a sensor to a person that they walk into a room with that tells them what the the clean? You know, that's that hasn't been figured out yet. So, so we're trying to do all the right things to make sure people know that we're doing something, but to really prove to one of our guests that it actually is working. That's, that's something that needs, you know, that's, there's no answer to that yet that I know of. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So TJ, what has Friedrich found to be the most effective technologies to use in products to improve IAQ? Um, you know, almost going back to my, you know, my first response, which was, you know, listening and watching what's what's really going on. So with, with the smaller room sizes, um, you know, one of the things that we've done is is made, uh, you know, variable capacity equipment, right? They can they can adjust, you know. So so um, you know, the VRP and the pressure PTAC both both have inverter technology that can you know can shed the, the capacity and and adjust not only to the demand of the room but also work in smaller rooms. Um, and, and one of the things that we've done more recently is we've launched an even smaller version of an air conditioner. A lot of times you hear a company talking about bigger and better and faster. Well, we've actually gone smaller. So our, our newest VRP product line that we that, that we have is called the VRP Studio. Um, it's an effective 7,000 BTU unit, but it has the ability to flex up and down from that 7,000 BTU. So it fits these smaller room footprints much more precisely. And the important piece there is that all the stuff we've been talking about with, with maintaining that space, it's sized for, for conditioning a room that size. Not too much, not too little, the right size, bringing in the right amount of, of makeup air condition. It also has, um, so then back to the technology part of the question is, it has the, the ability to capture, so it has um, MERV 13 filter capabilities. It has UV, it has um, ionization through the I-Wave technology. And it can also be a great HVAC system along with all of those. So continuing to, com to combine all of those and make the package fit the construction that's going on right now. So the, the types of buildings and, and, and rooms that you know, the Terry and team are, are designing for and that Carl and, and his guests you know, are, are demanding, um, you know, that, that's, um, that's really what we've, what we've been focusing a lot on. And, and that, that product just launched this year, the, the VRP Studio. So. I'm really excited with the, you know, the traction that that has. Mm -hmm. And I know I will be talking about the money aspect a little bit later, but I would think sizing those units to appropriately to the, to the size of the room is going to help the hotel side with, you know, purchasing and installing and doing all that they need to do. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's actually every aspect of, of cost of ownership. So it's the, um, you know, it's the upfront cost. Um, so, you know, having a properly sized unit is going to, you know, cost, you know, a, a better amount. It's actually physically smaller. Um, so you give up a little, you give up less, less space. Um, the cutout size that you put in the wall is smaller. Um, but also because it's a smaller capacity unit, it's going to consume a less electricity over the life of it. So, um, so your, 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 not only is your performance better, your efficiency is going to be better and your, your cost of operation and total cost of ownership will be better. So, um, you know, every, every aspect of that, again, is, um, we could have, we could probably this this group could probably have a, a an entire hour or or ten on uh, properly sizing HVAC system for you know, for guest rooms as well, and then just the the importance and the criticality of that. So, um, yeah, very good point. You know, if I could add one of the things, I'll be uh, jumping on TJ for a second, but you know, in the old days, we used to condition outside air and blow it into Carter and hope that it went under the door and into the guest room. And the reality of it is we tested with Magna Helix and it doesn't work. You're trying to push air through a duct that's three feet wide by three eighths of an inch high, which is the undercut of a door with interest because of noise and confidentiality and all that kind of stuff today to seal the bottoms of those doors up. And what we learned is that really didn't work. There's something in a build in hotels that run 24 seven called elevators and they're just giant big pistons and they move air all over the place. And we really can't control what they do. 
Um, so where did it, where did all the toilet exhaust come from? Well, it, we hoped it came under the door, but then it would have gone straight into the into the entry vestibule, into the bathroom, and get exhausted out of the building. So it never really got into the sleeping area of the guest room. What we really found out happened is that air was just infiltration leaking through the exterior facade of the building, through windows and cracks, doors or whatever. Um, the good news was that you were getting outside air in the room. The bad news was, I believe, I'm a, I'm a believer in that if I really want to bring in outside air, I got to get it on a coil to be able to dehumidify it, condition it, and control what that air is doing inside the guest room. And the VRP now allows me to do that. I can bring in that outside air, which code requires me to do, in a controlled, dehumidified condition in a situation where I don't have to worry about the negative effects of high humidity levels because we all know what that does to buildings. We, we end up uh, growing all kinds of weird stuff. So um, so the VRP is awesome. It, like I said earlier, it's it's a fantastic product that we, we believe in pretty wholeheartedly. So. Mm -hmm. so kind of like we discussed earlier, it's not so much the room design yeah that affects how all this works. It's more what the, the technology and, and the, the units that you're putting in that's going to give you that conditioned fresh air, that's gonna give you the dehumidification, that's gonna give you what you need in each of those guest rooms. Yeah, and like I think one of the best things that happened was I, conversations going back several years ago when they started talking about putting in, about making, they called it at the time the VRP07. Um, I was adamant about it. You know, I don't need a 12,000 BTU unit. I understand why they did that coming out of the chute from a production and a modeling and everything else standpoint, because it did have a variable speed compressor that could ramp up and down based on the load. But the VRP07 is much more conducive to a standard size hotel room today. And the other nice thing about it is, is when I can ramp the compressor down, even at a minimum load condition, I'm still getting air across a cold coil and I can still pull an awful lot of moisture out of the airstream when I do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So TJ, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about the CFA and, and, and how, how you, uh, your systems really, you know, cover that from beginning to end. Sure. Sure. On, on the, on the fresh air side, um, you know what what we do is we, we through a proprietary you know patented system we bring in um, outside air through the same opening that we're cutting for the for the, the unit so it's the, the important piece is we're not asking you to put a standalone module um you know or, or, or a, a secondary cutout um and then we're, we're bringing it in and uh, drafting it up you know up through the unit um you know through dedica a dedicated air system and filtering it filtering the outdoor air with a Mervate filter, which um, ASHRAE also recommends as part of that, which is really, really important um, because there are there are other ways to, to condition air, but you also, you also, you know, you need to look at all aspects of, of what the requirements are and that, because there are, there are good reasons for, um, for these codes and, and the way that they're written or standards in the way that they're written. Um, and then we condition it you know, utilizing the, the VRP itself, not a separate standalone module with a separate on off switch. So I think Carl uh, might have mentioned you know, before um, you know, the importance of, of continuing to use these devices, not just buying them up front, but continuing the operation of them. Um, this is an intrinsic part of the VRP system as well. So while, while yes, you could go in and, and, and disable it if for some reason you needed to, um, uh, you know, that you, that you made the concerted you know, decision to, um, to disable the, the outside makeup air for a period of time. Um, but 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 in general, it runs as the unit runs, and it's using it, it's using the logic of what is the room telling me that I need to do? It needs to be hotter, colder, um, less humidity, um, and and doing all of that within all within the one the one box. Um, so Lou, I, I know you you were uh, you wanted to chime in on uh, off of Terry's comment. Um, I, I just wanted to, to make one comment there. One thing that we know, uh, partly as a result of ASHRAE standards, partly as a result of, um, of green building standards, is that this is a trend. I, I'm really glad to hear that, <laughs> that, that Friedrich's got a smaller unit because it's a big problem uh, in, uh, in HVAC design in all buildings is that we basically oversize things tremendously. It's a, it's a cultural problem we have in HVAC. I, uh, you know, over the last 40 years, I've seen it. Bigger's yeah. just got to be better. What the heck? It's not that much more. Maybe it's even less if we make a bigger unit. And it's disastrous from the point of view of humidity control. So um, when you when you combine terrific insulation, uh, much better windows, 
okay, and real air tightness in buildings, and then you add LED lighting to that, what you have is really reduced loads on top of loads that were already small uh, in yeah. many parts of a, of a hospitality uh, uh, structure. So, um, you know, the fact that, you know, smaller units are available, this is great because on the residential side, there's a very serious problem with with lack of good products in the very small sizes <laughs> because we don't have two ton loads for air conditioning in the northern tier in, in single family residences at 2,400 square feet. You just don't have that. So you can't get a good, you know, half ton <laughs> cooling unit for a residence. And I'm really glad to, to hear that, uh, that, that, that room units are, are now available for uh, in the smaller sizes with variable capacity as well. That's just great to hear from my point of view as someone who's looked at the HVAC industry as a whole. Yeah, one of the things that I do that we've talked a lot about and I've talked to TJ and, and the guys at Friedrich about it, and I say to a lot of engineers is a hotel peaks at four o'clock in the afternoon facing due west in the middle of August. And what's the common denominator <laughs> to most hotel rooms then? They're empty. So there is no load to speak of. So when the load hits, it, we're nowhere near peak. And that's why the 7,000, because it'll go down to like 25% capacity, right, on the minimum setting. So I can take a load awfully low and, and really run the unit the way it's supposed to be run. So. That ties and into TJ one of the questions. That the... Go ahead, Carl. Sorry, I was just going to say, TJ, TJ promised that the uh, – the VRP 07 was going to be 25% of the cost of the original VRP, right? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so glad to hear that. This actually all ties in with a question from the audience about will Friedrich introduce a PTAC with speed compression that will modulate down to 3,000 or 4,000 BTUs, depending on the load. Um, because this this uh, this audience member is in New England and says that um, manual J load calculations around 4,000 BTU cooling, so they would be very interested in you know something that went down to those levels. Is that, is that in the works? Uh, it's actually uh, on the market. Um, so about uh, two years ago, we launched what we call the Fresh Air PTAC, um, and we named it that because of the fresh air capabilities and the makeup air and IAQ aspect. But one of the things that you also get, the reason that we can condition that air constantly is because it's got a variable speed compressor, an inverter compressor, um, and can condition down to that three or 4,000 BTU level. So um, uh, we can, you know, tie in some, I think I think um, our handout here is about the VRP, uh, but we also have one for the for the fresh air PTAC, um, yeah. you know, that, that um, we have that exact, to be able to solve that exact problem. Perfect. That, that would be a, a great way to uh, come out of this with um, helping both sides, the you and the, uh, the hotel owner. Wonderful. All right. Speaking of the money issue, which we have, you know, brought up a couple of times, money is a huge issue for everyone in the hotel industry, you know, given this environment. Does a focus on indoor air quality affect the bottom line and can it be a benefit to the bottom line? Carl? So it's, it, there's definitely a cost associated and it depends on what level we, you've heard different ionization, you know, um, filtration, there's molecule, et cetera. There's, so there's different effects to the bottom line, but there is definitely an effect to the bottom line. Um, but it's an important thing right now. So, so we're looking and implementing some of those things in some of our hotels, uh, even though it does affect the bottom line. And there's, there's always uh, something else that uh, Terry and his team of, uh, of, you know, the guys over in the design and construction division over at Marriott or any of the other brands that are willing to help. Hey, if we want, if we need to get uh, 700 bucks a room out, they're willing to work with us so that we can make an improvement in another area. So we've had those conversations and those, those are, those are very important conversations to have right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what you're finding, Terry. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I, I, 
you got to think about bottom line, right? Every people don't build hotels for nothing, right? They build them as a business and they make money and understand that. And, and outdoor air, when you when you calculate out the energy costs of heat and cooling and dehumidifying outdoor air, 365 days a year, it's a lot of money. And it's easy to say increase ventilation rates and just pump more stuff in. But I think I think the, the, the code levels where they are right now from an indoor air quality standpoint re regarding the amount of outside air we pump in buildings, I think we're going to try to keep that kind of where it is right now. But I think there's more effective control systems and things we could do to better, you know, to make that, you know, less burdensome on the bottom line. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, like Carl said, I think I think that's that's the wave of the future, quite frankly. I think, you know, the, the way we treat guest rooms is a, it's a very small two, 250 square foot guest room module, maybe something like that with a seven foot ceiling. So you're talking about something that's about 1,500, 2,000 cubic feet. It's a very conf small confined space that I think we could have a tremendous impact on. Um, but you got to think about the bottom line of stuff. It's easy to just say spend more money, but I don't think that's ever going to be the right answer. I do think if there's anything that's come out of this whole thing, in my opinion anyway, is I believe that there was a semi-sensitivity to indoor air quality before this. It's a shame it's taken something this catastrophic to do it, to, to raise people's awareness about indoor air quality. But I think it really has forced, um, kind of forced everybody's hand in the industry and hotel ownership groups and management groups and everybody else to really take this stuff serious. I don't think this is going away and I don't think it should go away, quite frankly. Um, there's very few things in my industry that are kind of swords to die on, um, you know, in, in, but that this is one of them. I don't, I don't compromise on indoor air quality, humidity control, or any of that stuff. It's just the end result is just catastrophic, in my opinion. So anyway. Mm -hmm. So TJ, what do you tell people when they're coming to you looking for solutions but are worried about the bottom line? I mean, what what can you tell them that, that shows the importance of, of this whole topic? Sure. Yeah, so, you know, um, you know you can tie this back into you know properly sized units, right? So we just talked about you know the the upfront um, you know cost appropriateness and then also the, the savings over time. Um, but you know I, I think I think the the overall thing that you have to look at is um, what you know is getting the choosing the right piece of equipment, right? So there are we have multiple, we talked about multiple technologies, P tax. Um, and you know you, you can and you can do these on scale, just like there are various chain scales of, of property. You can do it on scale of HVAC equipment, right? And so there's there's the PTAC, there's the fresh air PTAC with variable speed technology and and IEQ features. There are verticals, there are verticals with variable speed, and you, you can kind of you can you can I don't, you should uh, you know again if, if I were if I were trying to not be a Friedrich spokesperson, I would say you know you, you should align yourself with a manufacturer that can be collaborative in this. So just like Carl and Terry talk about how do how do we solve the problems that our guest rooms have, you should have you should have a manufacturer that can come in and say, look, let me show you what I can do to help the problems that you have. And Friedrich offers we're, we're fortunate because we offer a very broad problem. I would say the broadest um, suite of products, no pun intended, for for the hospitality market for in room um, conditioning. So. Um, you know, we, we can we can make that fit the right size, and you know, but but having you know, as a, as opposed to just a manufacturer that says, hey, here's here's a book, here's one or two product lines, is this what you want? Um, you know, understanding what the needs are. Um, you know, is it, is it a dry arid climate? Um, you know, in the desert Southwest, is it a humid climate in the you know in the Gulf Coast? Um, what are the problems you're trying to solve beyond just air conditioning? Um, and make sure that the manufacturer can actually help you with that, and and, and understands it. Um, and I, yeah. so I think that's that's one of the ways that's the way that we all that's the way that we have approached our product development and our go to market. So um, it was is that collaborative um, again, understanding that the cost is a big drive. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. All just all hotels are not the same, so you do have to really account for you know the climate, the weather, you know everything that's going on outside, and that, that's an important point for for hoteliers to remember. I think. All right, we have a few questions from the audience now I want to bring up. Um, one is, do you have any recommendations for retrofitting systems that are older, maybe not working at the current recommended levels? I, I'm, I'm guessing this is someone who can't completely upgrade right at this point. So what can they do any, you know, without 
go short of re reinstalling. Go ahead, Lou. Uh, I think that uh, one of the solutions that Carl mentioned and, uh, and also Terry is a pretty good solution in terms of filtration. A portable HEPA uh, air cleaner in the rooms is probably the most effective way to get at the filtration problem. Um, MERV 13 for, uh, for older style uh, PTAC units is probably not a practical thing. Uh, it's probably going to really mess up performance. <laughs> uh, so if, if you don't have a something with a little bit of beef into it, as apparently uh, a TJ stuff does, then probably a portable uh, HEPA is a very good idea in rooms. Uh, to Carl's point, I don't know how you keep people from walking away with it, but uh, but but for sure that that would uh, go a long way towards uh, implementing the ASHRAE recommendations about about air cleaning and especially air cleaning between uh, between guests and between uh, the housekeeping staff and guests. Have portable helpers are a good idea. They work. We know they work, um, and they're very effective for for COVID nineteen. And one of the benefits you have by going that route is if you have a hundred room hotel, let's say you could buy 10 or 15% of inventory. So you could buy 10 or 15 units. You don't have to buy one per room. Whereas some of this other technology, you got to go put one in every single room. And that's where the cost goes up, quite frankly, especially when you got hotels out there running 10, 15, 20% occupancy, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of building on that, another question is about, is pertaining to the number of air changes needed between occupancy that has been mentioned several times. How, what are the procedures of making sure that that happens, of identifying that time between, you know, air changes and then next occupancy? Is there some way, what's the best way to measure that so that you're following that appropriately? There's no easy way to measure that. Um, I'll, I'll give you a couple suggestions. One is that if you if you have a, a portable uh, a HEPA, then it's a pretty easy thing because you can calculate the airflow, the cubic feet per minute, uh, uh, compared to the cubic volume of the space. And so you can know that if this thing is running, you're going to get a certain number of air changes that are cleaned through the filter. So that that's a that's a done deal. So yeah. the other thing to do, which is an, a relatively easy thing, again for the more modest properties, uh, is open the windows. <laughs> okay, in the right weather, of course, but we're we're approaching reasonable weather, um, and and that would be another thing to do. And especially in terms of housekeeping, one could imagine a protocol where you come in, open the window, clean, and then you know, close the window, um, you know, some number of, of minutes afterwards. That's not an easy thing to calculate. Uh, the easiest thing to calculate is, is when you have a portable HEPA because you know what the airflow is and you know how, how, how much is being cleaned. Yeah. All right. This has been mentioned, uh, I think, once or twice. What is your position on the bipolar ionization units in public areas and in guest rooms? Yay or nay? Go ahead, Lou. <laughs> I, I'm not persuaded that they're a good idea um, because my, my, my view is that I have not seen convinc compelling evidence that they do anything uh, of any consequence with respect to COVID-19. And I say that uh, both from the point of view of our investigations on the COVID-19 uh, task force. And then before that, for the last several years, as a consultant to the Environmental Protection Agency on their publication on air cleaners in the home. I wish I could be more positive about bipolar ionization, but I don't see uh, compelling evidence that this is uh, a practical matter to achieve the amount of ionization that you would need to, uh, to do anything uh, uh, beyond what uh, a filter would do. A filter we know works. Uh, uh, bipolar ionization, we do not know that. Uh, so I haven't, found, I haven't found compelling evidence that it's a good idea. My view is uh, ultraviolet uh, for in-room uh, as opposed to induct 
is probably something that we will see. Uh, we know that it's effective in hospitals. It has a 30-year track record of success in terms of sterilization of both air and, uh, uh, and surfaces. So I think ultraviolet for upper air disinfection um, is going to be something that we'll see in restaurants and in auditoriums and uh, bars and places like that because we know it works. We know it uh, it does away with viruses very quickly. That's not something that's being used extensively now, partly because tough to get a hold of. It's very much in demand. But bipolar ionization, my view is, I wouldn't bother with that. I'd put my money into filtration because we know it works. Mm -hmm. Terry? Yeah, so, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting. I saw that question come up about the way you treat that, you know, 2,500 2, cubic foot guest room and the way I treat a million and a half cubic feet exhibit hall are two totally different animals. Um, and, part, and part of the struggle that I've got is because I do a, a lot of full service hotel work as well as figured out what are we doing both? And the answer may not always be the same. I do think UVC filter banks in big air handling units are great, but what worries me about it is, is that, um, they're expensive to buy. If to lose point, you can't get them today. They're expensive to buy. The lamp replacement lamps are horrendously expensive. I worry, okay, we solve a problem right now, but what happens, you know, whatever years down the road when the lamps burn out? Um, I also don't think, you know, UVC is a great technology for killing what it sees. If the light hits it, it is in fact going to disinfect it. But what about the stuff it doesn't see? And there's a lot of spaces in just a plain old meeting room that the UV, UVC lights never going to get so that I were I'll go against Lou here and he and I talked about this months ago um, I've seen it there's a bunch of bipolar ionization on the market I have seen and looked at a bunch of different ones a bunch of quite frankly a bunch of them I wouldn't touch there are a couple out there that have got third-party independent lab certification to deactivate COVID um, I think it's a great technology in my opinion uh, for big central station air handling units um, guest rooms it gets a bit pricey like we've talked about so many times before but again time is going to tell i think that we uh i think we just keep digging into this stuff and trying to understand this technology better and what it you know i think there's so much product on the market that doesn't work i think it's easy for everybody to say that it's not good to do right now and i'm not suggesting that lou you're wrong at all <laughs> you stretch the imagination but i think that's where we are today mm -hmm. all right tj this one might be for you um, is there, are there differences between VTAC and PTAC units when it comes to outside air and indoor air quality? Yeah, good question. And, and, um, so I'll speak from the Friedrich perspective, um, because there are different, um, outside air or makeup air PTACs and VTACs on the market, or at least ones that make claims of that. So when, when it comes to Friedrich, with our products under the fresh air banner, which include the VRP, the fresh air PTAC. Um, they, they are handled very similarly. Um, the, the PTAC itself has a has a dedicated air system, dedicated fan, MERV-8 filter that, that brings air in um, and utilizes the, the air conditioning system itself, the PTAC system, not a standalone dehumidifier only um, module. So um, so it can actually condition, it can make it warmer, colder, and dehumidify it um, as, as is needed to meet the conditions within the room. So for, for the Friedrich products, it's a very similar system, and that's why we have it under the same moniker of fresh air. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just the, the form factor that really differs there. Um, and you know, obviously the ability to distribute the air you know, differently throughout the, um, throughout the space. But, um, but our PTAC, our fresh air PTAC works very similarly to our fresh air system and our VRP. Um, and that it is dedicated and, and um, part of the system itself, or the, 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 main, the main system, which can do, what we say to boil it down is, it can do a lot more work than a, than a modular system, than, a, than the, you know, the equipment with just a little module. Mm -hmm. All right, this question is a little less about the equipment and more about what we were talking about, about communicating with guests. Do you foresee that facilities will need to post publicly similar to an elevator permit that the facility is clean to a specific standard and meets or exceeds these requirements and also for for the air the air cleaning I think that will ever be a thing no Carl it's a tough one yeah 
That is a tough one. <clears throat> I think it's normal. See how we come out of this pandemic, and if things continue to go well, I would my guess would be probably not. Um, that would be my guess right now. Possible. Lewis, what do you think? Well, I, 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 I definitely think that there's going to be a, um, some proportion of the public that's going to want uh, assurance that 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 covers some standard. Uh, let's say, yeah, okay, there's good air quality according to this metric, and within ASHRAE, I know um, the society is struggling with uh, how to quantify, for example, volatile organic compounds. Not all volatile organics are the same concern, but the sensors right now measure, the ones that are affordable, uh, you know, measure a broad base of volatile organics. So if, for example, you were peeling a tangerine next to one of those, as I've done, uh, you would get a, a very unfortunate signal that would suggest you were in deep peril <laughs> because of limonene. Limonene is one of the volatile organics that uh, um, that is measured by a broad base uh, volatile organic sensor. So there are definitely problems with uh, with uh, with validation. I think probably there there probably will be a, 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 a utility on the marketing side um, for saying we provide. HEPA grade filtration in rooms. We provide MERV 13 uh, filtration. We provide these things that are recommended, um, and therefore you can be more assured that that you're getting into air quality until the point where it could actually be measured uh, in, uh, uh, in an affordable basis in rooms. But that's totally me speculating. I'm afraid I have no standing to <laughs> imply that that my judgment is good in that area. <laughs> <laughs> Well, improving my point from earlier, it all comes back to marketing. So <laughs> that actually brings us to the end of our roundtable. I want to thank all of the panelists today for your time. Thanks to the audience for joining us and Friedrich for sponsoring. Um, a recording will be available to watch on demand um, within 48 hours on hotelmanagement.net. And don't forget to download the um, handout before you go and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>